we wanted to run the uh, end the run of the exhibit on a very special note and feature one of our most honored members of the museum family, World War II veteran and artist Dick Nelms. Now, Dick was born on February 17th, 1923 in Cleveland, Ohio. So 1923, February, that means Dick is going to be celebrating his 101st birthday next month in February. Dick volunteered for aviation cadet pilot training in the Army Air Force in 1942. After receiving his commission and wings in 1943, he was assigned as a pilot on the B-17 as a lieutenant. He then flew to the UK in April of 44 and was stationed in the 8th Air Force 447th Bomb Group at Rattleston, Suffolk County. He flew about half of his missions as co-pilot and then was promoted to first pilot and finished 35 missions in six months' time. For his service, he was awarded five air, air medals, the Distinguished Flying Cross, and four campaign battle stars. After being uh, returned to the U.S., he became Squadron C-3 commander for the remainder of World War II, and he received the rank of captain in the reserves. After the war and transitioning back to civilian life, Dick became a commercial artist and art director for the next 45 years. After that, his semi-retirement included repairing objects of artistic and historic value. And of particular note, and we'll talk about this today, Dick was the creator of the official seal of the state of Washington, which you can see, sort of, on the flag <laughs> off to the side of the stage here right now. So please offer a warm welcome to our good friend, Dick Nelms. Joining Dick today in the conversation on stage is another member of our museum family, Dave Wagner. For 26 years, Dave served active duty in the U.S. Army until retiring in 1993, reaching the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He served in combat from 1969 to 1970 during the Vietnam War, where he flew in 125 combat air insertions. He was awarded the Air Medal and received a Purple Heart. He also wears a Combat Infantryman's Badge. Uh, Dave retired from King County Metro Transit as a transit operator. He drove buses even during his Army career for 53 years. Please, everybody, welcome Dave Wagner to the stage. <laughs> and then finally, and sorry to take up so much time here, guys, but uh, before we begin, it's going to be my honor to share with you the text of this special letter we just received from the uh, Washington St Secretary of State, Steve Hobbs which he wrote in recognition of Dick Nelms in his appearance with us here today. January 26, 2024, dear Captain Richard Nelms, I am privileged to recognize and congratulate you for your years of outstanding service and commitment to your country. First, thank you for your service as a B-17 Flying Fortress pilot during World War II. To have been in the air during D-Day and survived a 10-hour mission to Berlin with a plane full of holes, what a life you have lived. As someone who served in the U.S. Army and now in the National Guard, I know what kind of sacrifice defending your country is. Thank you as well for your hand in something else I am close to, the Washington State Seal. As you know from meeting with Secretary of State Lude Kramer in 1967, Washington's Secretary of State is the official custodian of the seal. It is an honor to utilize your design every day. Thank you so much for your hard work and dedication all my best, Steve Hobbs, Washington Secretary of State. Um, congratulations on that, Dick. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. And we'll begin the program. Thank you all so much for being here with us. Thanks, Kale. Um, you left the service and went to Bakersfield, California, correct? Correct. And then what happened in Bakersfield? You got interested in art, I know, but let's tell the people what happened. Well, my, my mother lived in Bakersfield. When I got out of the service, I had no connections except my mother. So I moved from South Carolina to Bakersfield, California. And uh, I took a uh, course at uh, Bakersfield Community, no. A Bakersfield College at that time. Yeah, it's now the University of Wash of um, California. California. <clears throat> but um, decided to uh, become an architect and and sent my 
transcripts up to the University of Washington. They refused them because they had no room for out-of-state applicants. So there I was, and uh, I went down to the, uh, the VA to see what might be open for someone like me. And, and he said, well, what did you like to do? And I said, oh, I always like to draw things, but I, you know, I, I enjoy just scribbling. And he said, well, there's an art school opening up up on uh, uh, Capitol Hill. Why don't you go up and talk to him? And I did, and I joined and took over, th over three years of art training. All about drawing. It was all about drawing, wasn't it? In the very beginning. All about drawing, using the pencil, and uh, doing all that kind of work. Uh, question, why uh, was the U filled at that time? Why was the University of Washington filled? Too many veterans coming home? Uh, yes. Yeah, they, they uh, all, all veterans coming out uh, were, were usually drafted before they got into college and some out of college, and they wanted to continue their education. So they flooded into the University of Washington, and there was no room for any out-of-state out people. State people would have cost yeah. much more as well. Yeah. Um, then after the art school, what happened? Well, I became um, employable, <laughs> barely. <laughs> Got a job with the one-man ad agency and uh, learned quite a bit. I became the art director, which is not too much of a deal at that time. But um, then I was hired by a, a larger uh, ad, ag ad agency in Tacoma. And... Uh, that didn't work out too much, too well, because I wasn't ready for advanced stuff like that, and uh, the art director did not help. And there was a lot of uh, uh, things going on, the politi political things that I just didn't like. So I went back to tonight to um, <laughs> Seattle. Seattle. I almost said Niagara Falls. <laughs> I went back to Seattle and uh, started freelancing in, in the top of a uh, printing company, a little space up there. And uh, it, it, it started working out better and better. I got better, and uh, uh, I met uh, quite a few good artists at that time, and we all decided to join and call ourselves Graphic Studios. And. Uh, uh, I, I could name them all. One, one Bob Cram, who was a cartoonist, and Ted Rand, an excellent illustrator. Erwin Kaplan, a wonderful cartoonist. And, and uh, Roy Miller and me. It, it, uh, it worked out very well. We used to joke about it, that we'd be together more than we were, were, would be with our families. <laughs> But that, uh, th that was pretty much my art experience. Mm -hmm. I know that um, last week we talked, and you told me that there's a lot more for folks here to understand about graphic arts and all that it takes place. Maybe you want to explain a little bit of that. Yeah, uh, at that time... Uh, the computer, of course, wasn't being used. And uh, the telephone was your lifeline. If it didn't ring, you were out of work. Of course, we'd hit the bricks, go around and meet people, meet art directors. And, and the advertising agency was pretty much the lifeblood of the artist at that time. And uh, we, we'd get a phone call. Can you come over? We got a job we think you can handle. And it, it didn't matter whether you were in, in a, working on a job at that time or not. You'd say, oh, yeah, I'll be right there. And uh, the, uh, let's say he, it was an art director of, a, of an ad agency. He would have thumbnailed out some ideas that he wanted me to carry through. 
I would get pages and pa pages of the typewritten copy that was going to be in this ad. And uh, that's all I would have. I'd take it, take it back. The first thing I'd do would be to uh, set, up, set out the uh, type, the type size, and how much of that page it was going to occupy to see how much left of the page I would have, whether it be photographs or illustrations or whatever. And uh, then I would try to decide uh, why was this ad being produced? Was, was it aimed at young people, middle-aged people, or the elderly? And it would mean a lot on the direction I took. And I would do thumbnails, about four inches square of possibilities and go on and on and on. And, and check out a few and, and then do actual size, real rough layouts and come to one that I thought was going to work. Do uh, what they call a rough layout, a, 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 a preliminary. Take it back to the art director and he would say, well, change this little thing, but, but go ahead and give me, give me a comprehensive. So I'd go back and uh, really nail one down. It would almost look like the finished ad. And take that back, they would show it to the client, and the client might change something or other. It would come back to me, and I would start doing what they call the finished art. And that would be putting everything together, getting all the types set, and um, having it so it could go either to the printer or the newspaper, or wherever it was meant to go. And um, see, one thing I don't want to forget to say is that fine art and commercial art, the, the main difference is that fine art is a painting that can be produced and hung on the wall. Commercial art is done solely for reproduction. The actual finished piece may not, may not look like anything at all because uh, you'd be using paper that would have red spots on it and all kinds of things. <laughs> and uh, that would be the main difference because some of the illustrations done in commercial art could be called fine art, very beautiful things. But I did some painting in, in, in art school, but my main idea was to uh, do design work. Should I keep going? Can we have the next slide? I want to skip back a little bit because I want the folks to see your first little art, and that's the nose art on a B-17. I knew you'd love this. So. Um, what did you, how did you paint that on the, tell, tell me about that story. Well, when I went to high school in, in Columbia, South Carolina, I uh, worked part-time in, in the A&P supermarket. And I learned to do some sign painting at that time. So when we got our airplane over in R R Rattleston, uh, I think it was our um, radio man that decided that uh, a good name would be Pandora's Box. <laughs> Pandora's Box. And uh, because, uh, as, as most of you probably know, Pandora's Box is a, is a uh, story coming from the Greeks where Zeus had all the evils in the world in a box and he gave it to Pandora. And naturally, since she was a woman, this, this is the way it went. Not, not, it's not the way I feel. <laughs> no. She opened it, <laughs> let all the evils out. So we, we pretended that we were those, those evils. And uh, it, it worked out pretty well. But I, I, I painted, painted it on the nose. 
and uh, it, it was okay. I, I wouldn't have done it the same way today, but it just just script, you know. So I know we've got a lot of veterans here, but there's people who are not familiar with what that's called. That's called nose art on the front of a plane. There's a lot of planes that have different kind of nose art, but what's remarkable is Dick was asked to paint that and and name the plane. But let's reverse and now come back. You've uh, come to Seattle. You're now a graduate. Um, and there was something else that happened in art school, but it wasn't doing with art. What was it? It was, I think you met somebody there at the art school. I, I met a Marine. You meant a Marine. A beautiful Marine, a lady Marine. <laughs> and what happened? Well, after about three or four years, we, we, we married. And uh, okay. we went 61 years. 61 years. She passed. Uh, and she passed away in uh, 2014. Mm. And I've actually seen her artwork in your house, which is uh, absolutely gorgeous. Excellent painter. Yes. So uh, one of the things that I asked Dick in the very beginning, what was his favorite art project? Do we want to talk about that now? Uh, let's go to the next slide. An architectural firm called me, uh, Durham, Anderson, and Freed, no doubt not there anymore. And they were building a building that would house all of the King County books, the depository. They needed a sign. And they came to me and asked me if I'd like to do it. And I said, sure, I'll tackle that one. And here you're talking about books. Well, what, what was I going to do? The, uh, I, I did some research, and everything I could find would be a pile of books with a, with a, a candle burning in the middle of it or something like that. A, a sign that, uh, that designates uh, a, a function of a definite building has to be simple, has to be strong. So I, I worked from that. I, I, I thought, now, a book is nothing but a piece of matter unless someone decides to read it. Then it comes alive when that first page is turned. And I felt so good about that. It just, I didn't have to work real hard trying to think of a good design. And uh, the architects were delighted and, and uh, the King County uh, administration were, were liked it okay. And, and I, I got to, uh, well, West Coast, not National, West Coast Awards on that, on, on open, open competition. And it, it's, it's my favorite because it just snapped and I felt I, I just couldn't possibly do a better job. Because they see that book and that's, that's a depository, you know. And that's what's on the screen right now. You, you've seen the picture, so you don't, don't turn around, but that's what's up there. So when you see that logo uh, on the King County building, um, you told me that the first time you saw it was at night, and it was lit up on the side of the building, and it was blue, right? Uh, what the folks probably would like to know is from the early 70s till the year 2000, as was the logo for King County Library System, and Dick designed it. And uh, it sat there. So what a symbol for all those years. Uh, Roberta and I went down to, to see the building. The building's gone. Um, some of you will know where it was. Uh, if you're a Seattleite, it sat down by the old King, Count, uh, King TV station on Dexter. Um, not very far away from that. And that logo then became the trademark, right, Roberta? The trademark. And so 30 years, Dick. 
that that was there for 30 years. No wonder it was your favorite. Uh, someone told me that the sign was now at the Museum of History and Industry, that they didn't just throw it away. They, oh. well, they did. So now, next visit to History and Industry, we're going to look for that logo down there. You also ask, I ask you about, uh, give us an example of how you approached projects. How did you approach them? You told me uh, you had a systematic way to approach projects. Well, I said a little bit about that already, but uh, it, it would depend on, on what the project was, of course. If it's an ad, a magazine or a newspaper ad, you go at it slightly differently than if it's a multi-page brochure or an annual report. And um, the, the first thing you have to decide is what is it for? What's it supposed to do? And all the art involved is supposed to support this. And, and uh, I, I could think a lot more, uh, more about it then than I can now, <laughs> believe me. But uh, the, um, the main objective was to do something that would answer the problem not too far out. You, you didn't want to, uh, one of the biggest problems, I'll say, was had, had not to look like any other thing. Not to copy something. De-copy it. Make sure you don't look like something else because they're expecting originality. But you can't get too original, then they don't understand it. it it's kind of an iffy thing. And, uh, but... Mainly, if, if you do your best work and you know what other artists are doing and, and you don't want to get too far away from what's being done every, everywhere, uh, you, you can come up, with a, come up with a good job. Later on, I'll mention that uh, uh, at, uh, after the ad agency situation, dealing with other people like that, uh, it, it was it was good and it, it was uh, a good money maker. But the fun thing was when I did some corporate identity programs, where you'd go into a company, decide a new trademark, and take it through everything: stationery, trucks, the signs on the building, do the whole thing. And boy, that that that's a lot of fun. And uh, I, I ended up doing quite a few of those. But um, is that pretty much it? Yeah, that's it. But you, you just hit on fun. Can we have that next slide, please? I want to talk about something that was supposed to be really fun. This is about a band that existed out on Mercer Island by the name of Reflections. You know that? This was a band that my son was in. He was the bass player. They started out just by playing together at, after school, and the school gave them a, a special place they could come up and practice. And uh, by the time they were uh, freshmen in high school, they were playing for colleges. They were quite good. We called the name Reflections, and uh, I designed the... Uh, well, it's actually a, a, a complete uh, package that we would send to the to the uh, person that was going to have a dance. Well, they had an, they had an agent, and uh, the, the 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 situation here uh, went to a photographer that I knew, a good good photographer, and told him the problem, and and we we agreed that. It would be nice to show a reflection, them and then them again upside down. And how are we going to do that? Well, let's put our, this long table and put a mirror along there and adjust the mirror so in the, in the lens of the camera, you've got that. And it, I think it worked out very well. And uh, 
And inside I had their business card, uh, a little bit of a history about each one of them. And uh, uh, let's see, what else? Oh, a large poster that they could put up in school. Pretty much the same thing. But that, that was a lot of fun. And, and of course, I didn't charge them anything for it. <laughs> but you were the graphic designer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the other day when I, I surprised Dick that uh, we found this on a deep dive about this, the reflections, I showed his son Garrett, and I said, oh, we're going to talk about this. And he says, oh, God. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but fun stuff. And uh, Now he's uh, a professional bass player. Yeah. yeah, he's very, very good. So I guess uh, one of the last things that actually came b before the logo, I think. Let's talk briefly. Can we have the next slide? The seal of the state of Washington. Yeah, but it's big. Um, so why don't you tell the story? <clears throat> well... I'm not sure of the date, but it was in the early 60s when something came up in, in, in uh, Olympia where they wanted the state seal to use, the, the, the real seal that would clamp down on a, on a piece of paper and leave a, leave a mark. They couldn't find it, and that became quite a, quite a terrible thing, see. <laughs> and one of our art director people was a member of the Art Commission of the state of Washington. And he got into that and said, uh, let me get stationary from all of the agencies of, of the state. And they, he did, and not one had Washington looking like another. They were all different. And as... Uh, all designers would know a, a person has one thing, one logo, a company has one logo, a, a country has one flag, and it goes on like not not twenty of them. And so he 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 sold that that idea. They need one logo for the state of Washington. The original back in eighteen eighty nine. Was, was told that the Secretary of State uh, took, took a postage stamp and put it down on the paper and then put an inkwell on top and drew a line around on the inkwell and, and had a circle around, the, around Washington. And that, that impressed me. And uh, I, I figured that this is, this is no place to showcase myself, to do something very contemporary. Then two days later, it has to be redone. It's out of style. So I went back and, and got some research on, on uh, art that had been done then, pen and ink work. And uh, I, f I found pretty much this and, and re redid a lot of it. And, uh, and, and the original, original had uh, a cross hatching in the background, lines crossing like that. But um, I, I was, um, I was, I figured that's that's enough. I I I, I was pleased with uh, with the situation, and it went to a vote in in the legislature, and and well, one person did not vote for it. Guess what his name was? Nate Washington, <laughs> and. Right or wrong, he claimed that he was a descendant of George Washington. And, 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 and as long as I'm a descendant of George Washington, I, I doesn't look like him. <laughs> and, and, uh, but he, he had his say, but it didn't, didn't make any difference. And uh, so, so it, it was accepted. And Dan Evans, who is a champion of mine, I just, just loved him, was governor. And uh, we, we had a lot of fun afterwards on that. I think you said that what you loved about it was 
yeah, you, you don't like that really big, but if it really came down to a smaller seal, yeah. it really had the appeal that you were after. So it could be big or it could be small, but it was still that same seal. Yeah. Well, that, that was one of the problems, yeah, that when you do something like that, that uh, can, it, can it work large or can it work about an inch high? And, and it can. Even when those lines fill up, when it goes real small, the shadowing and everything looks okay. And that, that was part of the problem. Cool. So yeah. we're at the part of the program now where we're going to let the folks ask their questions. Okay. And as Cale said, if you'll come to the mic, and what Dick and I agreed to was it can be a question about World War II or a question about art. Um, what are your questions? And please don't be shy. First of all, I wanted to say I'm from Bakersfield too. I grew up in Bakersfield, so there's something we have in common. Um, I wanted to ask, um, because you were a pilot and because you were a co-pilot of B-17s, was it easy to design the Pandora's box, being a pilot and everything with that? Or did you design that before being a pilot? Or was how did you design that based on your own B-17 experience? Uh, well, we had the airplane. Right. All the 10 of us had decided that was going to be our airplane. And uh, I, I actually think we flew a mission in it before I painted that on there. Because all, so many of the other planes had, had pretty good artwork. And they said, we got to have that too. And they said, well, let's save Pandora's box. So I did it then. I had no training other than being a sign painter at, at, in a grocery store. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and I actually have one more. Okay. Um, if you guys don't mind, this is for both of you. Um, when you're first starting out in the military and people are just like yelling at you and stuff and all this stuff that goes on when you first start, was it easier to be a commander or was it more stressful because you'd already been through it already. Well, my my error, no, <laughs> don't uh, it hadn't picked up a lot of what you said. Let me let me try that. So when you first went in, I think your experience when you went into basic training and then went to flight school going through, going and through. everybody's yelling at you when you first. Drill sergeants doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, how how did that then affect you? Uh, so that later on in your career, was it easier to be? Is this? Am I going the right way? Yeah. Like, was it easier to be a drill sergeant having been through all of it, or what? Or a commander having been through all of it, or was it harder, or were you more sort of compassionate? Uh, I don't. I don't think it had any effect on me. Okay. And and uh, uh, when we first uh, got uh, when they first got a hold of me, I'm gonna put and it took it took me to Nashville, Tennessee. We went through what they call cyclomotors, two weeks of of what you're talking about, where they would yell at you. Yeah. And. And, and you try to be lining up two pegs that are white 20 feet away so they beat together. Well, a sergeant's yelling, what are you doing here? You can't do that kind of stuff. If you get it, what, 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 what are you doing? You know, and, and a few swear words. Just to see if you can handle stress. Yeah. And I passed most, almost all of those, I'm sure I did, because they decided I should be a pilot. Those that uh, were very intelligent and uh, maybe didn't do as well, they sent to navigator school. <laughs> now, I say intelligent, uh, that they were. Uh, <laughs> we used to joke about, and the ones that were left over were bombardiers. <laughs> I, I, I didn't 
get to be a poly <laughs> Please, I'm, I'm, I'm joking a little bit here, but uh, uh, yeah, it, uh, the whole training in the Air Force, the combat I went through, everything all made me stronger for the rest of my life. I, I, it takes a lot to make me afraid right now. Ew. I can't remember the last time I was afraid of something. And, and to help Dick, one of the other things they want to do is not only see your stress limit, they want to make you quit. And if you don't quit, you're going to get better and better and better. Um, for me, I went through officer candidate school, which was a lot of yelling every day. And pretty soon, you start laughing at some of the yelling because, uh, let me give you an example. When we were in there, we were hungry all the time. And so at night, some of the wives would bring pizzas out to the parking lot, and we'd have to go out to dump the trash. So we dumped the trash, we put those pizza boxes in the garbage can, sneak them back in, right? Well, a uh, TAC officer would smell that, and, and so what we learned how to do is this bribe him, and then he'd get off our back. And that's how we dealt with it. So you learn after a while how to deal with that stress. And, and then it doesn't bother you like that. So that, that yelling, all that is is try to break you. And, and you don't break, you become a stronger, better person and a better soldier. So that's how I see it. And for me, it lasted 26 years. So um, I'm grateful for it. Thank you, and thank you both for your service. Yes, sir. Hi there. Um, Captain Nelms, uh, thank you for being here. This is uh, an honor. And I have a, a quick question about your retirement. And when you retired, were you using computers uh, by that time? And how computers impacted your artwork, if you had been using a computer at all at that time? Did you use computers at the end? Oh, in artwork? Yeah. Oh, yes. No, yeah. I, I always um, felt that my thoughts should come out of the end of a pencil. And uh, maybe old fashioned, maybe I didn't want a computer at the time, but it just started in as, as I became, uh, oh, I never did quite retire, but uh, uh, yeah, it, uh, it didn't help me. I, uh, I don't think it would be now. I, I, I thought it would make it too easy to create something and it should be, should be difficult. I, I don't think you're retired, Dick. You come here every Saturday and stand out by that B-17. <laughs> you know, how many other people, I don't see you as retired. <laughs> yeah. well, let, me, let me just add something quickly. To, uh, this, this museum has rejuvenated me. It has given me a new life. And at my age, you, you lose your friends. Most people leave us before they get to be 100. And, and I've, I've found some wonderful new friends, and I, I just can't say enough for it. Yes, sir. I, I was wondering for you, when going into um, Capitol Hill, I, I went to art school in Capitol Hill as well, and it was a, it's a very different time. I was curious what it was like to go from a soldier to an, to an artist. If it was the same art school? No, no, just what, what because for, for, for me there was a, the, the cultural difference was was really big. Oh, what it, what it was like to go from being a soldier, uh, and then now you're a civilian and you're going to art school. Well, it it wasn't difficult. I uh, I remember when it was time. You know, we got points. It had a point system. Being overseas, you got points. Being in combat, you got points, so forth. I, I was fairly high, and it came to a time where I had to either decide to re-enlist in the Army or become a civilian. See, it was the Army of the United States at that time, 
in order to stay in, you had to re-enlist in the, in the regular army. Well, to do this, you, you stood, you sat in front of a general that was asking you, what did you want to do? And I said, well, sir, would I still be flying? And he said, uh, sure, now, and you'd be flying, you'd probably be flying a pencil. And by that, he meant what they wanted was my experience, my intelligence behind the desk where it would be important. They could get pilots just like that, one right after another. And I said, well, sir, I think you've hit it on the head. I've always enjoyed drawing, and I'm either going to be an artist or an architect. And he said, well, sorry to leave. Sorry you're going to leave us, but go for it, you know. And that was uh, pretty much it. Does that come close to your question? <laughs> Uh, Dick, I'm Jerry Souza, one of the uh, Thursday docents here. Yeah. And I've uh, listened to your story at the Quonset Hut for uh, quite a while. I'm working up a, uh, I've been researching, working up a, a program for a World War II tour. And I came across something I wanted to ask you about. Um, when General Doolittle took over the uh, mighty Air, Th Air Force, one of the statements he made was the primary mission of the 8th Air Force was to destroy the German Air Force. Without destroying the German Air Force, you couldn't have invaded Normandy on June 6, 1944. And the secondary mission was, of course, to destroy the German uh, factories. Were the crews aware that their primary mission was the destruction of the German Air Force? Uh, no. No, we, we just knew that we had to go over and bomb things that were helping Hitler stay in war. And I think we did one heck of a good job. Well, I totally agree with and Thank you for your service. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> Dick is one of your newer friends at the Museum of Flight, and I'm so happy to have you here. Uh, what was your most memorable combat mission with the 447th Bomb Group? Oh, wow. I know it's an oh, wow. Maybe D-Day or what? What was your most memorable mission? Well, the one I, I tell most of the time is my second mission to Berlin, where we had what they call a maximum effort of the 8th Air Force going to Berlin. The, the Berlin area, not just the city. Uh, our group never did bomb the city. We had a target that was, like I say, keeping Hitler in the war. And uh, we got to the initial point, the 18 aircraft got the initial point and turned towards the target. The bomb bay doors would all open. The lead bombardier was in charge. He'd be sighting on the target. And we wouldn't know when we would get there except the bombardiers would be listening to the lead bombardier. And when he said bombs away and we'd see the bombs coming, they'd, they'd hit their toggle switch real fast. But as we got towards Berlin, the sky turned gray. It was a, we got into another dimension. Bombs burst, shells bursting all, all around. We're flying right through it. We knew we were getting hit. You could feel the plane would be rocking around in concussion. And you could hear that black pieces of steel tearing holes in the aluminum skin of your airplane. And um, not only that, but the wind changed or something. It either a jet stream we didn't know about. We were under fire for almost a half hour, if you can imagine that. It was almost like five or six hours. Nobody on our plane got hurt. We got back to the, to the field. I think one of our planes got lost, or lost, shot down. We got back to the field, and the, I think that the, the radio man again said, why don't we count the holes in the plane? Well, we took a lot of damage. We started counting and got tired of counting at 300 holes in that airplane. And you couldn't tell from flying it. Nothing vital had been hit. Some of the holes were big, as big as my fist. Most of them were about the size of a quarter. 
in different shapes and jagged. Some went right through the plane. They went in one side and out the other. And uh, that, I think, was probably, and we, we lost a lot of airplanes. The first, the first report was that we lost 68 B-17s on that one day. Then it was changed to 48 with B-24s included. <laughs> then it, I think somebody, it, in print, in the newspaper, it came out 28. They didn't want to tell you the, tr the truth at that time. So I think we closer to 48 airplanes, 400, 480 men if, uh, if they all went down. And, uh, and you can't get out of that airplane if, it's, if it starts spinning. You can't get out. Thanks for the story. Thanks for your service to our country. And thanks for okay. involving <laughs> in the flight. Thanks, Ken. So, <clears throat> Dave and Dick, I, this is kind of for both of you. Uh, Dick, as a <clears throat> retired military pilot and as an artist, I have a real appreciation for that because I, I grew up with that uh, public library logo. That was very familiar to oh. me. <clears throat> so, when I was flying in the Navy, uh, it was a job. It was a job and the airplane was a tool. Um, currently, I fly the B-24 Liberator for the Commemorative Air Force and we take it around on tour every summer. And one of the things that I've found from veterans that come up, uh, families of veterans that come up, is there's a real nostalgia. We tend to look back those times in combat uh, with, with the romance. There's you know, this, this filter that we look at it that was a very romantic time with a romantic job. And Dick and Dave, this, this applies to both of you. you know, at what point did you in your career look back at the time that you were flying in the military and, and go, oh wow, that, you know, I really like that as opposed to this sucked. I, I have to get up every day and fly into combat. You know, was there a point for both of you where you can look back and go, wow, that, I, there's a romance to that now. That really meant something to me. Uh, after I did my tour, I stayed with the field for a while, became a squadron duty officer with a jeep and did various things. The, um, just a second here, I started out right. A, a group came to the field and wanted to test dropping skates, heavy weight. A, a big, big platforms with, with uh, um, sand, sandbags on it. And I didn't know what it was for a while. They wanted me to, to help. So we, we, they loaded up the B-17 with those things underneath, and uh, finally they told me that it was to be uh, uh, food, food and supply drops to the French Maquis underground, as well as food to countries that were starving. And uh, I said, oh, okay. And so I, I figured out the, the right speed and the right altitude that I felt would be good. At the, and uh, the speed would be 90 miles an hour. And that, that's pretty slow. At altitude 500 feet. And um, I wrote some of the specifications. They dropped them and it worked out just fine, just what they wanted. The, the parachutes would catch it just before it hit the ground and would not break up. And uh, I later found out that uh, these missions were taking place, and that, that I felt pretty doggone proud of that, that I was involved in, 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 in uh, saving lives. And uh, I'll, I'll quickly go to one more. Probably my most valuable mission, two of them, where our troops were being held down after D-Day in the St. Lowe Peninsula near Normandy by superior German forces. And our group, as well as other groups, uh, carried anti-personnel bombs and dropped them 
just a couple miles in front of our own troops into the German area. And uh, after two days of that, the German general was, was quoted as saying, I have no more troops, no more guns, no more tanks, everything is lost. Which was an over, they, they still had some, some opposition going on there. But we saved thousands of American lives. By we, I mean the 8th Air Force that had, to, that had this mission to do. So those two things, I think, were things that I'll always remember and be glad that I was in on it. Yes, sir. In regards to your dropping food, that was after the combat, after the uh, Germans had surrendered? Question mark. Uh, no, it, the, the war was still going on. But uh, they, uh, of course, uh, you may be talking about the, the, the Berlin airlift. No, the food drop that you did in a B-17 when you got slow, yeah. low, and drop bags of food. When was that? Uh, was that? Probably 1945, I guess, at the beginning of 45. That was after Germany surrendered? Not, not yet. Not yet. Not, not yet. It, it, um, I don't, I don't think we, we owned the sky at that time, and um, uh, I don't think there was any opposition. At, uh, I know we went into, they went into Belgium, and they went into some of the Scandinavian countries. Uh, several other questions for you. Yes, sir. Uh, you flew into some terrible flak and so forth. How many crew members did you lose and still survive and still bring the plane back? Well, we lost two, but they um, uh, had, they had no uh, effect on the airplane. One was lost flying in another airplane, a tail gunner, and another another was lost with. Uh, left waist gunner getting a piece of flak in his hip and they couldn't stop the bleeding. And by the time they got back, the, um, they had to amputate his lower leg because it had not had any nourishment. But th those, are the, those are the two. Uh, that was the only time I saw blood. There, you, did, you were successful to survive 35 missions in very ugly flight conditions. Could you tell ourselves, the group, how many air crew member was lost delivering bombs on Germany? Well, I know thousand? that of my group, I'm not sure. I, I was thinking the total number of uh, airmen that were lost. Oh, in the 8th Air Force? Yeah. Over 20,000. Imagine that. I've read 30,000. Uh, 20? 28. I've read 30, I've read 20, 29 and 28. So I say over 28,000 men were killed. More than the Marine Corps. Imagine that. Just, just the 8th Air Force. But thousands of us got home OK, like me. Pretty proud of the destruction we had done to Hitler's war machine. Thank you, thank you for having guts and balls to continue as you did. Well, thank you. Thank you. Hello. I was wondering what was the first time you flew a plane and if you noticed a difference in the way that the public um, felt about planes after the war, having seen the success of them um, being a tool um, during that time, uh, if that's something you ever think about. Yeah. Well, I, I remember when I was in uh, so just maybe 10 or 11 years old, when a plane would fly over, you'd run outside and say, airplane, airplane. And, and uh, when I got, 
uh, when it was time for me to go to primary training, it was not only the first time I'd been up in an airplane, it was the first time I'd been inside of an airplane. <laughs> it had no occasion. And it was an open Stearman biplane. And uh, the instructor was a World War I pilot. <laughs> and uh, an, an excellent guy, but he d didn't know how to talk without swearing at me. <laughs> <laughs> but we went up on my first flight, and he, he said, how you like it? I couldn't talk to him. He had a one-way deal. And I, I, I nodded like this. He said, well, I'm going to teach you how to do this pretty soon. And he did a snap roll. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, oh, my gosh, maybe I should have gone into the tank corps. <laughs> it was violent. If you no. know what a snap roll is. It's not like a snow roll. You know, it's just wham. Like that. So that, uh, did, did I get off beat there? Oh, no, no, that's perfect. And then the, the older part was, um, did you notice a change in how the public felt about planes after the war? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, well, a lot of people thought that all, everybody's going to have an airplane. And they, they, all kinds of people would, would have these funny looking airplanes and flying around. Well, we know it wouldn't, wouldn't happen that way. It'd be all, you know, if you have car trouble, you can get out and raise the hood. But if you have air trouble, you cannot do that. <laughs> And, and you have to find a place to 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 force land, and uh, and that takes a lot of training, and you'd have a lot of people dying. But airplanes by then, you know, in, in, invention is is becomes a, a, a result of necessity, and. Everybody was thinking about winning this war and making better airplanes in Jeep. By the time the war was over, we were flying a, a jet aircraft. And, and uh, it was uh, just marvelous, really, the way that, that, that thought advanced into the real thing. Thank you so much, and thank you for your service. It's an honor being here with you today. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question about your career in art. Um, what was your favorite piece of design work that a client didn't end up using? Mm -hmm. Did you, let me see if I got this right. Did you feel like there was anything that you designed that might have been passed over that you thought was really good? Oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah lot, lots of times. Well, with ad agencies especially, they, they were afraid the client would get upset if you showed them something that was too far ahead. And, uh, and artists, as you, most of you people know, when you, when you can create something that you hadn't done before, and it worked, and you liked it, and the color balance, everything looked good. And then they say, uh, no, you're going to have to do another one. <laughs> But it, it would happen. And uh, with that, I think we're done. Um, and thank you all for being such a wonderful audience. And uh, thanks, Dick. Are we out of here at 3? It's 3.08. So we did pretty good. Thank you both, Dave and Dick. And thank you all again for being here with us today. Let's, let's have a good round of applause for these gentlemen.